talk, sir. Uh, I welcome all of you to the 79th AIOC conference. To get started with the first session, uh, let me call upon the chief instructor, Dr. Atik, Dr. Atik Sheikh Ahmed. Uh, over to you, sir. You can take over. Thank you. Thank you, Swapnila, for this uh, uh, early morning session. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our uh, course on Unraveling Biometry Mysteries by this wonderful uh, team. IOL power calculation has evolved significantly over the past few years. Techniques which were considered gold standard are obsolete now. We are going to talk on practical aspects on how to ensure that we get optimum results out of the equipments and instrumentation that we have. The first talk will be by me. I will be talking on K yesterday, yesterday and today. We will discuss on basic aspects of keratometric measurements, advantages and drawbacks of keratometers, when to use topographers and significance of true K and integrated K. So keratometry has always been evolving over time. Well, corneal astigmatism is present in about every third patient that we operate. This was a study which was published in Eurotimes 2020. And uh, I was actually surprised to note that I was under the impression that presbyopic IOLs were the ones which were gradually increasing or the number of implants were gradually increasing with time. This is what I was communicated by our pharma friends. But then this uh, question-based survey was actually surprising. And I found that the prevalence of astigmatism correction was gradually increasing over time. So this shows that keratometry is still the king. A small uh, introduction about history of how keratometers came into existence. This lovely equipment was invented by Herman von Helmholtz. And this picture I was going through when I was trying to learn about keratometry was the first keratometer that was invented by von Helmholtz. And this is actually there right now in the University Museum in Netherlands. This has two glass plates and these glass plates can be rotated to measure the cornea. The beauty of this equipment is even so many years back, he had an equipment which can measure the cornea at different meridians. It is not like the keratometer of today. We can actually measure keratometry at different meridians. But then the drawback of this was it was very time consuming and the patient had to fix it. So Jawal and Shiats came out with the more practically usable keratometer in 1881. This is what holds good even now. Even the Bosch and Lom print, uh, keratometer that we use has a principle similar to this. So what happens in this keratometer is the anterior corneal surface is actually measured and the posterior surface is presumed and it is calculated based on a keratometric index. This works on the principle of fixed doubling. So why this fixed doubling? The reason being if doubling principle is not used, micro movements in the eye are always present, which ensure that we don't get values. So the use of a biprism negates that drawback and helps us to measure astigmatism. So some practical tips on how to do manual keratometry. This is a lovely instrument. Even now can be done with reasonably very good results. Calibration is very important and we have to ensure that the user has adjusted the eyepiece based on his refractive error. If you have power, please ensure that you correct it. Doing on a virgin eye is absolutely critical. Do not do it after doing procedures like applanation tonometry or after applying uh, local anesthetics, <clears throat> which will make the cornea go haywire. This is a patient with dry eye disease. And you can see as the patient blinks, the myers get clear. So the take home message is when you do your keratometry, ensure that the tear film is well, proper, and then do your keratometry. Do not do it on an eye, which is very dry. In case you're suspecting dry eye, tell the patient to blink frequently, apply a drop of CMC and do. Ensure that the patient is positioned well. These are small things which will give wrong values. 
the main limitations of manual keratometry includes keratometry can be measured with a manual cape only in the central cornea. The peripheral and the paracentral cornea gets ignored. And another drawback is this equipment assumes that the cornea is always regular and symmetrical about 90 degrees apart. In cases where the cornea is maybe the receptive skimming present, this can be missed. Till about six to seven years back, we believed the manual K was absolutely a terrific instrument to measure keratometry. Then it all started with this landmark trial by Dr. Douglas Koch, where he estimated posterior corneal astigmatism and found it to be significant. This opening of Pandora's box opened, opened a, a whole new endeavor with keratometry and astigmatism management in cataract surgery. In this study, he says that most of the equipments available then, the manual K, the second generation optical biometers, as well as auto K gives wrong values. Even Pentacam was overestimating with the rule astigmatisms and there was slight underestimation except the Galilee. So this brought forward the Douglas Cox, uh, so the Baylor nomogram, which helped us to correct this. And in addition to this, there were lots and lots of myths in K uh, value estimation. During my postgraduate days, about 15 years back, the main work of the final year or the second year postgraduate was to see the K value and decide how our chief operates, whether he sits superiorly or temporarily, because we believe that when we incise the cornea, there is, an, there is a flattening happening on axis. This, with time, became a myth. This is no longer considered because nowadays this flattening is believed to be a vector force and not just flattening. This happened with a great discovery by Dr. Warren Hill. He says less than 2.4 mm incision, there is not much of flattening actually happening in temporal incisions. So this was again during his, uh, uh, this was a trial by Dr. Graham Barrett, where he says, the accuracy of most calculators becomes far more significant, mainly for torics, when we use this uh, SIA of uh, centroid value of 0 0.12. When we use SIA of 0.3, you can see not much patients are uh, less than 0 0.5. When the centroid value is increased, when the centroid value is used, even our regular calculators give much better values. And if you use the Barrett calculator, you get even better values. So what about K now? Today, we have the uh, impact of total keratometry and integrated keratometry from our Barrett calculator. What is this integrated K? This is keratometry taking into consideration the posterior corneal astigmatism. This calculator, I'm not talking about toric IOLs, even for regular patients. All patients gives brilliant values if you use this calculator. This is available free of cost. We can go online, click on this K calculator, and we have to enter K from three different instruments, say our manual K, auto K, and IOL master. If we enter, this gives a pursue, this gives a predicted keratometry values taking into consideration the posterior corneal astigmatism. This ensures that we get much better results. And the beauty of this is, this gives the median value and not the mean. And you can see that this, I mean, this is not for uh, a toric implants. You can see these are non-toric eyes. This was a talk, a snapshot of a talk given by Dr. Graham Barrett. He says, even now, 88% of time, you get absolutely phenomenal results if you use the predicted posterior corneal astigmatism, or in other words, the integrated K. Right now, with the newer toys, we can actually measure the posterior cornea without using extrapolation. This is available with the current generation swept sourced based biometers. So what happens here is this uses a distant independent measurement of the anterior surface of the cornea. And this curvature information is provided on a toric surface model. Using OCT B scan, the posterior cornea is measured at about 18 points. And this is fitted onto the anterior surface, which is generated and a, a toric surface model is generated. Then using certain internal calculation, refractive indices of air, cornea and aqueous, Gulstrand's principle is used 
to actually calculate the total keratometry of the cornea. So what is this telecentric keratometry? Telecentric keratometry means that the distance of the patient from the equipment, even if it is a little offset, it gives precise values. So how the patient sits, minimal amount of tilt or moving front or back is negated and it gives phenomenal results. In other words, it is not that much subjective, it is more or less an objective test. The significance of actually measuring plays a far significant role if we are operating on post LASIK eyes. That is actual measurement of the posterior cornea gives brilliant results. You can see here 0.5 diopter error in a post LASIK patient is absolutely terrific. And in fact, it is nearly 90% in 0.75%. Uh, so the main sources of errors in keratometry involves the keratometers take values at different zones of the cornea. So what I want to convey here is the manual keratometer takes reading at 3.2 mm. The IOL Master 500 was used to measuring the cornea at 2.5 and the previous generation lens star at 1.7 and 2.2. So each does K value at different areas. So do not take values from one equipment and use it in another. Do not take your manual K value and use it on your lens star. This we will get away in 80% of patients where we have symmetric astigmatism. If there is little bit of radial change happening or minimal skewing present in the a slightly paracentral zone, we may get into trouble. So use that keratometer for that equipment. Do not take value from one equipment and use it in another. In the 90s, we used K only to measure biometry. Later, it was used to do incision location. And then in 2010, we started talking about PCA and then the predicted PCA. Right now, we use the swipe source based biometers uh... and measure it. Change is the only constant in life. We need to adapt to changes and evolve. Only then we will be successful. To sum it up, manual K even now has a role. With good slit lamp examination and proper evaluation, we will be able to get away in most of our patients. Use SIA of 0.2. Incision does not cause flat, flattening on the axis. Standard K with predicted PCA even now holds good. True K with Barrett's is useful for post-refractive surgery eyes. Thank you very much for listening. The second talk will be on ultrasound biometry by Dr. Pratibha Devi Nivian. Dr. Pratibha works as a senior consultant at MNI Hospital. Uh, she's been an alumni of Aravindai Hospital and Shankar Netralia, and she's trained hundreds of surgeons in cataract and refractive surgery. Welcome, Pratibha. Over to you. Please unmute you, ma'am. Pratibha, can you unmute and talk, please? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, respected teachers, colleagues, and friends, um, a very good morning. Today, my presentation is on ultrasound biometry. Does it have a role in today's practice? So today's cataract surgery is, has become a more of a refractive surgery. So the refractive outcomes after the cataract surgery mainly depends on axial length, keratometry, anterior chamber depth, and the lens formulas, among which the key factor is the axial length. So we all know even a small one millimeter difference in the axial length can give a 2.5 diopter difference in the post-operator refraction. So axial length can be mainly determined by ultrasound biometry or optical biometry. Uh, um, um, my talk is on ultrasound biometry, so I'll be talking only about ultrasound today. And there are two methods of uh, measuring ultrasound biometry. It can be a contact method or an immersion method. So the basic principle behind the ultrasound biometry is it uses sound energy. The A-scan probe passes a thin sound wave, uh, which penetrates the parts of the cornea, and the sound waves are reflected back the reflected waves are observed in the probe and they are projected as spikes. 
So based on the spikes, we, the readings are taken, the axial length is measured. The ultrasound probe uses a high frequency of 10 megahertz, and this high frequency allows better penetration of sound and also excellent resolution of the structures. So as the name indicates, this is a contact ultrasound biometry, wherein the ultrasound probe is directly placed on the anesthetized cornea when the place patient is looking in a straight gaze. So this is a picture of that. The probe is placed on the anesthetized cornea and the sound waves pass through the structures and the sound waves are reflected back based on the similarity of the structure. So uh, the, the first wave, what we get is the corneal spike here. Then we have the lens spike, anterior lens spike, the posterior lens spike, and the retinal spikes. So the, the spikes are of good amplitude if taken in a proper and correct manner. But in contact ultrasound microscopy, the, a lot of factor depends on the technician. The technician has to be really experienced to avoid compression of the cornea with the probe. In case of compression of the cornea, there can be erroneous wrong readings which can cause, give a false axial length and a false I will call calculation. And the posture of the patient is also very important. The patient has to look straight at a target. As I already told, a one millimeter error can cause a 2.5 millimeter difference in the post-operative refraction. Because of all these uh, side effects or uh, um, disadvantages, then came the immersion ultra ultrasound my biometry wherein there is a small scleral shell, as we see in this picture, the Prager shell, a coupling fluid, distilled water or saline is injected into the scleral shell and the probe is placed in the coupling fluid. So here we see a patient lying down and the probe is placed in the coupling fluid. So this immers immersion technique minimizes the technician variables, the corneal compression is minimized, leading to more reproducible results. <clears throat> So this is an um, ideal A scan, which we get from an immersion, uh, immersion technique. Uh, the, the probe is inserted into the coupling fluid. So the first spike which we get is the interface spike. Then we have the corneal spike as we already saw, and we have the anterior posterior lens spike and the retinal spike. And then we have the orbital tissue spike. Um, and this uh, ultrasound biometry, the machine also has the, the latest machines also has um, uh, all the is incorporates all the formulas for us to give um, accurate IOL power calculation. And for an accurate A scan, a proper calibration is mandatory. Accurate positioning of the patient is very important, and proper sterilization of the shell is important. <clears throat> so positioning, why is it important? This position is wrong. The patient has to lie supine without any tilt in the head. Why? Because when, when there is any tilt in the head, the sound beam which passes is oblique to visual axis and part of the returning echoes is reflected away from the probe tip and the spikes are compromised. So it, it might give a wrong axial length. However, when the patient looks straight, most of the echoes which are reflected from the structures are perceived from by the probe and they give good quality spikes and we get a proper axial length. Sterilization of the shell is also very important. The shell and the probes can be soaked in alcohol or hydrogen peroxide for at least five minutes and then they have to be allowed to dry completely and clean with BSS before using for a next patient. <clears throat> so this is an ideal A scan. As we saw, there are various spikes which are caused by the reflection of the sound waves from various structures. And these spikes should be of good amplitude. The height should be good. It should not be like blunt or uh, variable among the structures. And we should also have good orbital spikes. So in this scan, we find there are multiple steps and ridges and the spikes are not of good quality. So when we get such kind of spikes, we should ideally repeat the scan. And similarly, when we see here, there is a corneal spike, but however, the lens spikes are not very clear. There are multiple ridges. And here that we don't see any orbital fat spikes. So this particular scan is probably taken along the optic disc and these scans should be repeated. So and in 
when they are uh, dealing with a very dense cataract, uh, the, the sound waves might have difficulty in penetration. And so we might not have good quality spikes. So in that situation, in an ultrasound, we have to increase the gain settings. And when you are dealing with a patient with silicon oil filled eye, the velocity, the mode has to be changed to silicon oil mode because the velocity in which sound waves travel in silicon oil is relatively different. It is slow. So that can be pronounced sound attenuation and that it can erroneously give a false axial, long axial length, which can affect our IOL power calculation. So what are the advantages of ultrasound biometry? Ultrasound biometry is very good in dense cataracts, in very dense posterior subcapsular cataract, high myopic myopia, patients with no proper fixation. It is of all the parameters which I have told, the cost effectiveness is the biggest advantage of ultrasound biometry. Now let's see what literature says. This was one of the recent publications by Dr. Arud Chakrabutetal. They had compared ultrasound biometry and optical biometry. So ultrasound biometry actually measures the axial length from the cornea to the internal limiting membrane. The machine arbitrarily adds 200 microns universally for all eyes to give a, the pro axial length. But in optical biometry, the measurement is taken from the cornea to the retinal pigment epithelium. So a true axial length is obtained. So the errors with optical biometry is little is less compared with ultrasound biometry. In our ultrasound biometry, the modes have to be changed for aphakic eyes, silicon oil filled eyes, and sodafakic eyes. However, there is no adjustment required in optical biometry. Ultrasound biometry, both the methods are contact methods. However, optical biometry is not a contact method. And there can be factors of corneal compression, particularly when we deal with contact method of ultrasound biometry in uh, uh, ultrasound biometry, but there is no issues of compression in optical biometry. So generally the um, optical biometry is definitely superior. However, when it comes to cost effectiveness and, um, and uh, efficiency, Ultrasound biometry is definitely superior and it is, uh, it is highly practicable in, um, uh, it, in today's practice also. This is just a comparison of the ultrasound biometry with the optical biometers. The current generation and the latest IOL master, which is very efficient, is um, uh, I think 10 times more costlier than the basic ultrasound biometry, which through, uh, with which we can um, actually do all the uh, IOL power calculations successfully and efficiently, except few case scenarios wherein we might uh, definitely um, require the uh, newer generation techniques. So I did a small survey among the metas of uh, city of ophthalmologists to find out what type of biometers they have. And uh, um, in the survey, I found that 60% actually had an optical biometer uh, and 40% uh, had an ultrasound biometer. But when I asked, do you use ultrasound biometry? 90% said that they still use ultrasound biometry. This itself proves that it's not obsolete. It can still be used in today's and future practice. Um, efficient. So to conclude, Ultrasound biometry can be considered for axial length and IOL power calculation when properly done. It is safe and very cost effective for IOL power calculation. Thank you. I would acknowledge Ramesh sir and Ati for the helping you do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Pratibha, for this uh, excellent uh, talk on ultrasound uh, biometry. It was uh, very elaborate and uh, the survey gave actually a lot of information regarding the use of ultrasound biometer among ophthalmologists. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, uh, next talk will be on why optical biometry and how it scores over optical biometry. Well, to have this talk, we have uh, Arun Mulivarman, sir, Managing Director of Humai Clinic. He's a superstar in cataract and refractive surgery. He's trained thousands of ophthalmologists pan uh, globally. Uh, uh, I was his uh, fellow, and it is an honor to have uh, uh, Sir in this uh, elite uh, panel. Thank you very much, Sir, for being with us. Over to you, Arun, Sir. Uh, thank you, Atik. Uh, thank you very much for asking me to be here. So my talk is 
on um, why optical biometry. Well, Pratibha put out a very good uh, talk and uh, analysis and said that optical is excellent. And of course, uh, the uh, ultrasound is still being used by 90% of people. We'll come to that statistics and we'll analyze it as time goes on. Well, optical biometry is available um, for almost about two decades. When it came in, uh, it was a bit of a novelty and uh, somebody who was fanciful and footloose bought that instrument and kept it and used it. The first uh, instrument that ever came in the market that was optical biometer was from Zeiss with IOL Master. It had no numbers at that time. Well, it worked on somewhere about in Indian scenario, probably in less than 50% of the patients because uh, two decades ago, the number of patients coming in with advanced cataract was more. And this wouldn't occur, work even in a, uh, a mild PSC2. So you had this machine that was pretty expensive, it was pretty accurate, but you were not able to use it in a large amount of the patients. So it was just a novelty item sitting there. Plus there was enough and more data that was coming out from studies that showed that just buying an optical biometer did not increase your accuracy very much. Yes, it did a little bit, but it was actually not significant and many practices did not see a big difference in having bought an optical biometer that their accuracy went up. Third point, at that point of time, at time again, we were not very keen on achieving something as low as 0.25 plus or minus as a uh, refractive outcome after cataract surgery. We were quite happy with 0.75 maybe even plus or minus one. So to achieve something like plus or minus one or plus or minus 0.75, believe me, you can achieve it with anything. You can achieve it with a manual keratometer and an optical, uh, an ultrasound biometer. When you start tightening the screws and you want to get down to 0.25 and you want to look at toricity and you want to handle everything, then scenario changes. Plus at the same time, the technology kept changing that now the optical biometers have got to be better and they not only, optical biometer has not got better in measuring axial length, not a micron better than what it was 20 years ago. It's got much better in measuring the keratometric values. They are brilliant. We've started to understand that K values, as, as Atik said, is so very important for your surgical outcomes. So we really understood that K values and these biometers, whichever you're using, K values have got many fold better. Other parameters that you need to measure also have come in. So let's keep going from there. What do we get out of an optical biometer? This predictable outcome. So you get high levels of accuracy, but we always think an optical biometer gives you high level accuracy in axial length. It gives you phenomenal accuracy today on K values. And we, the K value by itself, its own Pandora's box, I think Atik has handled it very well. So that's very important. Does it really score on axial length over an immersion A scan? Not really. It really does not score. A well done immersion A scan is as good as an optical biometer. Where does it still, where does optical biometer score over? This can be delegated. A proper um, A scan, whether it is a contact method or an immersion method has to be done by a highly trained individual. It's got to be an ophthalmologist or an optometrist not just anybody, somebody who's highly trained and has been doing a lot of these procedures to be sure. While an optical biometer can almost be delegated to anybody and you can get excellent results. So that's where the whole change in the approach came. You will get good results irrespective of who did the procedure. While if your standard optom who is doing your A scans for you is taken leave and somebody else has done it, on that day, you're going to get bad results. So that is where it again scores. Definitely, it scores over the A scan in accuracy of A scan, uh, the uh, axial length on that basis that the need of a highly trained individual. And most important, all the necessary data is from one source. Earlier, the necessary data was only two or three. One, you had the axial length, you had the K value, and then you had the a lens constant that came from the company. Now you've got far more. You want to know the K1, K2, the axis very accurately. You want the posterior K, you want the total K, you want the corneal thickness, you want the white to white, you want the anterior chamber depth, you want the lens thickness. Well, things are just going on. And all of these have to be equally accurate. 
You can't have accuracy in one and not have in the others. And all of these have to be recorded. If they've got to be recorded individually from different instruments, everything starts to go haywire. This is where, again, then I optical biometers goes over the standard practice. As I told you, axial length alone does not suffice. You need to know all of the other data. So most important, again, we all have gotten to the issue of transcription errors. You have recorded the axial length. You've written it down wrongly. The K value has been taken accurately, has been wrongly entered sometimes. So transcription errors are something which are very, very difficult to overcome because you are looking at an instrument screen or looking at the instrument drum and then copying it down onto a piece of paper or into the computer. Transcription errors are human errors which are highly likely and they can occur. Going and correcting it is going to be very difficult. With an optical biometer, the chances of transcription error becomes nil because all the data you want comes off from one source gets entered directly into the software that you're, you're wanting to use the formula and out comes the output. So this is again one point with optical biometer scores over. When we talk about optical biometer, I think we should all stop talking about any other type other than SSOCT. Multiple um, manufacturers have got the SSOCT optical biometer. Since I have been using the IOL Master, I'm going to talk primarily on the IOL Master 700, but I have no financial interest here. I do believe that SSOCT based optical biometer of any source will be equally good. So one should look at optical biometry means, you should think that it means only SSOCT as of today. How, what are the advantages here? Axial length, anterior chamber depth, dense thickness, central corneal thickness, white to white pupillometry, keratometry. And in the IOL master, it also gives you the markerless suit where you have the callisto eye, you can have image guided surgery. So you can take the whole uh, surgery to a completely different level. As uh, Atik already mentioned, the telecentry keratometry is something that's taken it to a different level now. When you're measuring K values, it's extremely important, particularly whether you're doing the manual or the automated, that the Myers are perfectly focused. A slightly defocused Myers, even by a couple of millimeters, can give a slightly different value. While telecentric keratometry, takes away this one more issue because you really can't get the patient fixated that perfectly and get a perfect result. Telecentric takes away that slight defocus and gives you accurate results irrespective whether it is perfectly in focus or not. So it goes one step further. Most important, because it's an SS uh, OCT, posterior K is automatically taken. You can have a true K that's calculated from that. Now you can have the central topography of the central four to five millimeter of the cornea, which takes away the need for you to do a topography for every single patient. If a central topography is good, you can quietly go ahead with the surgery. If you have any issues with central topography, which you can see on the screen, then you decide to take the patient onto another instrument, go onto a more elaborate study of the topography of the cornea. So you have that little bit of icing on the cake that's come in with a new central topography on the IOL Master 700. So as again, Atik has told you, I really will not explain this. Anything that has got a web source or OCT base can look at both the anterior and posterior. It can even be shame flood. Once you look at both the surfaces, you can get the true K values, which are extremely important for perfect outcomes within plus or minus 0.25, which is the holy grail that we're looking for. The additional point that we get now is the central K central topography on the central four to five millimeters. That's truly, as I said, just icing on the cake. You can live without it, but it does save you a little bit of time and patient flow. So no second device. You get all of these things and the data can go into the formula that you are going to use. The OCT scan will actually look at the retina also and a decipherable image of the retina is available where you can have a visual confirmation that your reading of the axial length goes through the foveal pit. If you don't see the foveal pit as here, your axial length is not probably as accurate as you can see the foveal pit. So the axial length can be verified by actually looking at the foveal pit in every single case. And you can have a look at this image, a complete image of the whole eye is available for your perusal. Now you can actually, as I told you, you can uh, confirm the foveal pit. You can even see subtle, you can't see as clear as an OCT, don't think you're going to see a perfect picture, 
but you can have an idea that something is wrong in the macula when you're doing your SSOCT based optical biometry itself, that you start to look do, and look, do, go for a more clear OCT picture to know what is going on there. Most important, these are the cataracts that this SSOCT based system can penetrate. Gone are the days that a simple small PSC would prevent you from getting an optical biometry. Truly with this kind of cataract to the pupil dilated, you still get a perfect uh, outcome. So that means almost in my practice, it's almost well above 97 or 98% of the patients can be completely done with the optical biometer. It's probably one or 2% of patients who need to undergo an ultrasound biometry because of the media opacity. Even in those, all the other data, that is the axial length, the, the anterior chamber depth, the K value, and uh, sometimes even the lens thickness and the white to white is already got from the uh, some uh, instrument. So your accuracy still remains high. All the latest formulae are available, depending on which company's machine you bought because you paid through your nose, they also add on all the latest formulae. And once in a while they do update it, but their updation frequency is a little slow. So you may have to go at the online formulae to get the best results. The other one would be the sutureless, uh, say the markerless system where the data is projected on to the screen. So you have better results where you want to place your incision, where you want to do your uh, rexes, how you want to place your uh, toric lens. I will just quickly show you this video where this is incision marking. This is the marking for the CCC. Cataract is over. Then you can now have the marking projected on for placing the eye oil in place. So you have the markerless system, which is an absolutely added advantage, making everything far more accurate. To end, yes, the uh, eye oil, uh, the uh, optical biometry is something that is very, very useful. It's not a luxury. It has become a basic and necessary tool. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir for uh, sharing your wisdom on optical uh, biometry. So uh, there are a lot of new things that we learned uh, today. Uh, IOL biometer helps us to get brilliant values mainly because of refinement in K. We were all under the impression, or at least I was under the impression that it gives better axial length values, but actually they are not significant. And uh, the other thing uh, which I felt very significant was uh, from Sir Stock was it is easy to have the equipment, but actually knowing how to use it is far more important than just buying and keeping the equipment. And central topography, which is available with the current generation equipments, negates the need to put, make the patient for us to make the patient to go into another expensive uh, test. That is a topography or something like that is actually not needed if uh, you have these sort of equipments, which gives the central topography. We'll have discussions at the end of all the talks. Thank you very much, Sarun, sir. So uh, the next talk will be on why Barrett's for all eyes. For this, we have uh, Ramesh Durarajan, sir, Managing Director of uh, Sundarai Hospital. Sir is a sea of knowledge in cataract and refractive surgery and in toric implants and biometry. He's always updated. You listen to this talk tomorrow, he will give us uh, far more insights with uh, studies which have come up recently also. Thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. Ramesh, sir, uh, I think you're muted, sir. We are not hearing you. Uh, okay, you can hear me now. Thank you. So these are the various formulas that you can get from the Warren Hill site. So here we have the older generation virgins formulas, then the ray tracing. Then we have the Hiswan Hill RBF formula. But now we know that now we know that there are two ways of looking at, at biometry. One is to use the ultrasound biometry and the older formulas. The Royal College still advises us based on the axial length of the eye. So if you are going to do your biometry based on axial length, 80% of your patients will be within 0.5 diopter. 
But if you choose to use the OCT based biometer and the more recent formulas, 92% of your post ops will be within 0.5 diopter spherical error, and another 98% uh, will be within 0.75 diopter. These are the easily attainable targets in all parts of the world. So, why is the axial length based formula not enough? This seminal article by Jack Holiday showed us that there are many types of eyes for the common eye where you have a normal range of axial length and cornea, any formula will work. But we do have unusual eyes like a large eye with butol mass with axial myopia or we have eyes with microcornea and axial myopia where the normal relationship between the front and the back of the eye is lost and we need more measurements and not only the K and the axial length to find out the correct eye oil in these eyes. Server Nosby in 2008 showed us that as far as biometry errors are concerned, one third of the error is formed from the position of the lens. This is the ELP error that we have. A third is, measure, is in refraction, refraction lane length and the skill of the refractionist contributes to a third of the, of the error. And the last third is a result of both axial length measurement and K reading measurement. This, is, this was his finding in 2008. Wolfgang Hege, whom we lost last year, showed us that as of last year, the axial length measurements have reached a very high level of accuracy. And today we can change, we can find out the changes in the axial length with each beat of the heart. We can find out the changes in the axial length in the morning and in the evening. So axial length measurements are not going to, uh, more accurate measurements are not going to help us. It is the corneal K reading, and that is the key as far as the future is concerned. So which is a perfect formula? Till recently, we had this confusion, which is a perfect formula? But a, a, a wonderful study two years ago showed us that the ideal formula for optical biometry users was the Barrett suite of formulas. And this study was the Mellis and co-author study. It's interesting to note that one of the co-authors is Jack Holiday himself. And the purpose was to find out the accuracy of the current generation formulas. So there were 13,301 cataract operations where an, where an Alcon single piece lens was used. And the conclusion was very simple. Overall, Barrett's Universal 2 had the lowest prediction error for these two intraocular lenses. Now it's interesting to note that all these calculations were done using the lens dot and one particular type of intraocular lens. If you're using various kinds of intraocular lenses, your prediction error will be different and the spread of your post-op results will also be different, although the mean can be brought towards zero. So it's important to use a good quality lens and, and one of the most repeatable instruments is a lens star. If you look at the current generation of formulae, both Hill RBF and the Barrett's are all based on lens star measurements and the Alcon single piece platform. We really don't have formula which have been derived from the other, uh, from the other instruments. So this is the this is the a graph from that particular article. It's very easy to find. Just see this black line here. This black line shows the common axial lens. So for powers between 16 and plus 16 and plus 26, you will find that almost all formulas give very good results. This dotted line is a is a, a zero error. So if you take a if you take the zero line, you'll find that almost all formulas are good for this average normal common eyes. And if you take a spread of minus 0.25 and a plus 0.25, you'll find that the Barrett's is totally within this particular zone. So based on this, he found that, that this was the best. The recent version of the is always found in the APACRS website. There is no single Barrett's formula. It's actually a suite, it's a group of formula. And you have the Barrett's 2K formula, which is applicable for myopic, hyperopic, classic, for eyes where PRK has been done, where radial keratotomy has been done, and where keratoconus eyes are there. So this is where the Gulston ratio has been altered. For them, use the 2K formula. Then when you want to do a lens exchange or a piggyback lens, you have to use the Barrett RX formula. Use the Barrett toric calculator as your go-to for all your patients. And this is the basic spherical error calculation, which underpins all the other formulae, the Barrett's universal two formula. So you have a group of formulas, and this is the Barrett suite of formula. So this particular patient needed a lens exchange. 
pre-op, he had a dislocated lens with a thick after cataract. So you can use the lens exchange Barris RX formula, and then you can do you can do the surgery and you can you can find out the the power for that. Barrett screw K is should be used primarily for eyes that have undergone LASIK, PRK, and for keratoconus. The this is a uh, this is the uh, uh, mandatory entry form for the Barrett's universal formula. The optional uh, data that you can enter is the length, thickness, and the white to white. But even without these two, you will get a very good value for most of your eyes. White to white and lens thickness only matters when the lens thickness is very high, more than around, around 4.5. Below that, it, it will not matter. Barrett's formula, like Dr. Atik and Dr. Our previous speakers, including Dr. Arul mentioned, gives you the option of using the predicted posterior corneal elasticmatism uh, or the measured posterior corneal, corneal elasticmatism. Use the predicted posterior corneal elasticmatism for all virgin eyes. It also helps you to calculate the integrated K value. Integrated K value is slightly better than using the K from any one instrument. You have the option of using three different instruments. It can be a topographer, eyeball master, lens star, Aladdin, manual K, auto K, any one of this can be used. Two of the entries have to be from a, from a, a biometer and one, the last one has to be from a topographer. If you, have, you enter any two values, you will get an average value. If you can enter three values, you'll get a median value. So the median value of three uh, data points from the same patient is used to calculate the integrated K. That integrated K forms the basis of the anterior corneal measurement. And then the PCA is applied to that. The predicted, predicted posterior cornea is applied to that. And then it is used in the toric calculator. So these are the three different uh, entries that you can make. The last one has to be a, a, a topography. The first two are, are biometry values. Then this is the uh, this is a toric calculator where you want to use the actual measured uh, measured true K value, and this is of use in LASIK eyes and in keratoconus, where the gull strand ratio is altered. The true K values can be obtained from the Eyewell Master 700 Pentacam, any SSOCT device, an OptoView, or from any Shrine Flux device. Because the zone measured and the way each of these, these instruments calculate is slightly different from one another, it is useful for you to choose the option correctly. This is found free in the APACRS site. Today you can find it out in the ASCRS site also. But this particular APACRS site gets updated more frequently. Now, this is where we were two years ago. Then uh, right out of the blue, the same group of co-authors, Ronald Mellis and co-authors, came out with, the, with the one more paper the next year, published last uh, in 2019, April. The new Kane formula was the most accurate of them all. So they went back to the same set of data and they found that the excellent performance of the Kane, Olsen, and Baird's formula in both short and long guys is noteworthy given the historical difficulty in accurately predicting these groups. So you have one formula, the Kane formula, which is slightly better than the Barrett's formula. M most of us did not believe it till the second article came out, uh, uh, came out uh, in JCRS January 2020, where they went and assessed an independent group of uh, 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 data from one single surgeon in Bristol in the National Health Service. Overall, in each axial length subgroup, the Kane formula was more accurate than the Barrett's in this particular in, in this particular paper kane formula entry form is very simple you just need axial length k1 k2 and acd you don't need the lens thickness that's optional then you have a non toric part a toric part and a keratoconus so all in one you don't have many 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 different formula non toric toric keratoconus in one simple interface it is optional to enter the lens thickness and the cct this doesn't seem to make much of a change the Kane keratoconus formula had a statistically significantly lower MAE when compared to all the remaining formula. So, Kane keratoconus formula is more accurate than the Barrett's and any other available formula as of now. Now, Kane is not the only one. The EVO formula was, was first presented in, in ESARS in Portugal. It, is, it was discovered by Tun Kuan Yeo of, of, of Singapore. And uh, for this also, you need K1, K2, axial length, optical, ACD, 
optional is length thickness and the central corneal thickness. This is interesting. These two are, are optional. This is the only formula to my knowledge which has been modeled on the thickness group of lenses and also MA60. It is not primarily derived from the Alcon group of lenses. And also it is primarily derived from the Argos uh, biometer and not from the rest. The Kane formula also has a, a I will master 700 total K entry. The version two will, will accept a total K from non I will master 700 sources also. The EVO formula, sorry, the, uh, the EVO formula also has a more advanced version, the EVO toric formula, where, where you can do toric calculations. So this is, uh, uh, this is Dr. Tun Kwan Yo of, of, of Singapore, and, and he acknowledges the mentorship of Dr. Graham Barrett. He did his uh, internship with him, then he came back to Singapore, started his private practice, and then he pursued his own dreams. So in summary, careful measurements on a virgin eye are very important. Use the Royal College Advisory for Ultrasound Biometry. Consider Kane, Evo, and the Barrett's formula when you're using optical biometry. My dear friends, in summary, this is an evolving field. There is no end. And in the near future, we can look forward to more astonishing revelations and, and, and discoveries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful talk. So in 80% of patients, you will get away if you use even your ultrasound biometry and regular formulas. But you want your precision to be more than 90, around about 90, you have to switch to Barrett's and use your optical biometer. And the new things that we learned today were the Kane formula is slightly more uh, significant, uh, even more accurate than Barrett's. And uh, the keratoconus measurements, as sir mentioned, uh, I think this is the only formula which has uh, specifically for uh, considering keratoconus uh, patients. And uh, the EVO formula is also something that is evolving and uh, which is giving brilliant values. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, sharing your uh, knowledge on uh, biometry. Thank you, sir. So uh, the next talk will be on biometry in special situations. For that, we have uh, Dr. Jaint and Soundra Pandian. Uh, he's Managing Director of KSI Hospital, Erode. He's an alumni of Arvindai Hospital and Narayana Netralia. Uh, Jainthan has trained hundreds of DNB students and uh, fellows in uh, biometry and in uh, cataract and refractive surgery. A pleasure to have you, Jainthan. Thank you very much for being with us. Over to you. Thank you so much, Arthik. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Uh, my topic will be on biometry in special situation. Um, as you could uh, hear from Arul sir and uh, Ramesh, once you have an IL Master 700 and use a Barrett formula, no special will be a special situation. Uh, but still, uh, as we saw from uh, Dr. Pradeepa's uh, presentation, 90% of us are using still an ultrasound. So we'll just go ahead and see what would be the recommendation with the ultrasounds. Right. This study by Jack Holiday in 1997 uh, has classified the eyes based on the axial length and anterior segment into normal and abnormal. And to the surprise, only 73% of the eyes fall into the normal axial length and anterior segment category. And rest all are what we are going to discuss right now. The first of the spectrum would be a high axial myopia, the two in an eye that has gotten posterior cephaloma. A posterior cephaloma will cause an irregular shape of the posterior ocular wall. Uh, so here, there will be an inability to display a distinct retinal spike in the ultrasound. And remember, the deepest portion of the cephaloma may be located eccentric to the macula. So here, an ultrasound will give an anatomical axial length, that is, from the corneal vertex to the most posterior portion of the macular region, rather than on the refractive axial length, which is the corneal vertex to the foveal center, resulting an IOL power that is going to be too low. So the next complication would be uh, doing a contact ultrasound when there is a presence of low scleral rigidity in such a posterior cephalomatous eyes. So even if you are going to do an ultrasound, always make sure you do an immersion and not a contact method. So the potential solution would be to use a vector AB scan, where a horizontal B scan is used to demonstrate the shape of the posterior ocular wall and relationship of the macula to the cephaloma. Having fixed it the fovea, we can now go ahead with the A scan and then calculate the right axial length. The next modality would be to use a probe with the fixation light that is much preferable when you're using an ultrasound. The best of it would be to use an optical biometer and in an optical biometer, the best is to use an IOL Master 700 because it measures the axial by directly visualizing the fovea on the OCT image during the measurement. 
So axial myopia, whether without encephaloma, the main point is after calculating the axial length, the IL power calculation is going to be very, very critical. So an axial length correction for high to extreme axial myopia incorporates three different approaches right now. One is use and adjust the optical biometry axial length as been recommended by Wang and Koch. Uh, the most commonly used right now, the gold standard would be to use a Barrett Universal 2 formula. And the future could be using the Hill RBF method for higher powers that are more than six diopters. The other end of the extreme of the spectrum would be the extreme hyperopia. Here, the main point is that even a small error could have highly magnified outcome. For example, an axillant change of just a millimeter will produce a five, dif di five diopters of difference in the IOL power if it is less than a 20 millimeter eye. A small shift in the ELP in this small eyes will lead to a bigger surprise because the lens is thicker and is closer to the fovea. So again, the solution is to use an optical biometer and use a formula that calculates ELP from multiple parameters rather than just from an ACD. And in case if you are using an ultrasound, always avoid a contact ultrasound, go for an immersion ultrasound and use a Hoffa Q formula, whether ultrasound or optical, Barrett Universal 2 still holds good. In case if the ACD is less than 2.4 mm in an ultrasound, use a Hages formula. Macular lesion, cases where you have a denser cataract and if you are not able to make out the macula, uh, so there could be an edema or a hemorrhage which is sitting on the macula which cannot be visualized clinically. So this can lead to a shortened axial length, uh, mainly because of the issue in displaying a distinct retinal spike. So, uh, though the, we don't have an answer, but we need to identify such a situation clinically when you're doing an ultrasound. So, the clinical point is here is that you'll have an unexplained spike along the vitreous base. You'll have an inability to display the distinct high retinal spikes. There will be an abnormal separation of the retinal spike from the scleral spike. There will be an inconsistent axial and measurement, intra-observer and an inter-observer variation in the same eye, which is more than 0.2 millimeter and an inter eye variation of more than 0.3 millimeters. In such a situation, we need to take a call to do the biometry of the other eye and then discuss with the patient about the prognosis also. Similarly, in a denser cataract where there was a vitreous lesion, like an astroid hyalosis or a vitreous hemorrhage, the solution is to use the maximum gain setting to obtain a spikes of sufficient height from the posterior lens capsule to the retina. So whenever there is multiple spikes along the vitreous base, always be warned of some vitreous lesion. And you need to actually counsel the patient also. Right. Next is the silicon oil filled eyes and the vector mice eyes. The source of error here is that the low sound velocity of the ultrasound uh, leads to an apparent noise attenuation, making it difficult to identify the retinal spikes in the ultrasound. Silicon oil causes a change in the refractive index in the eye. And the ultrasound usually travels very slow in the silicon oil. And this gives a wrong message to the probe that the axial length is longer. And finally, the calculation becomes low, uh, lower IOL power. Usage of a standard ultrasound without the correction can give an error of up to eight millimeters in the silicon oil eyes. So again, the solution is you can use an optical biometer if you have an access to it, uh, because the main advantage is the change in refract index of silicon oil is less affected in case of an optical biometer. In case if you are using an ultrasound, try to use it in the silicon oil mode. Difficulty in measuring the axial can be overcome by increasing the system gain. And when you want to compare the IOL power, when you want to have a double check, usually a factor of 0.72 multiplied to the IL factor can give a rough estimate of the power in the silicon oil eyes. Denser cataract, as we discussed, you can actually increase the gain settings and it will be more complicated if the patient has got an inadequate fixation due to low vision, nystagmus, blepharospasm, strabismus. So you need to depend on the other eye status also. Piggyback IOLs, it depends whether it is a primary or a secondary. In case if it's a primary piggyback IOL, use a Hygis or a Hopper Q formula. Basically, you are going to divide it into two IOL. The single piece acrylic IOL will go into the bag and the three piece acrylic will go into the sulcus. So the IOL that is going into the sulcus reduce one diopter. This is going to be the calculation for the primary piggyback. When it comes to the secondary piggyback, the IOL will be based purely on the refractive error. You can use a holidays refractive formula or a barracks RX formula. Uh, the key here is uh, you need to actually, if it's a myopic error, you're going to actually multiply 1.2 to the error and that's going to be the IOL. If it's a hyperopia, it is 1.5 into the error. So that's a simple calculation, but you can use the uh, refractive formulas to get the perfect values. Uh, the main point is that you don't need a knowledge of the primary implant or the axial length, uh, which is not required. 
coming to the irregular corneas like the keratoconus the issue is that keratometry when done with a different instrument will calculate in a different zone and will give an inconsistent value which will also be less repeatable uh, this is mainly because of the irregular astigmatism that is going to present with the severity of the keratoconus usually the steepness of a cornea will lead to an unusual ac depth calculation which will lead to an error in the elp calculation the visual axis may not be always on the apex but can be on the slope of a cone which is going to affect your value calculations remember the keratoconus will create a negative spherical aberration so you need a positive spherical aberration or a truly aspheric iol to be implanted uh, so we'll skip this uh, case uh, the summary in keratoconus is that you need to use a k value from a tomographer always use a central k value never use a sim k values the axial and calculation will be better off from a optical biometer but with an experienced hand ultrasound is also good preferable to use a srkt formula that's what the literature says but a barrett universal 2 will be the gold standard in these eyes so coming to the main concept of the post refractive surgery eyes which is the most debatable uh, eyes here the reason why the calculation is going to be inaccurate in these post refractive eyes are that there are three main sources of error one is the keratometric index error the radius error and the formula error Usually, a keratometer uses a standard and a fictitious keratometric index of refraction that is one point three three seven five. It actually assumes the constant ratio of anterior to the posterior corneal curvature. Works well in virgin eyes, but not in cases of a post LASIK or a post PRK, where the anterior cornea is altered and the posterior cornea is unaltered. So the ratio here is disrupted. So the keratometric refraction refractive index is going to become invalid. the consequence is that a myopic correction patient will have an overestimate of k power and a consequently underestimation of the iol power leading on to the post post of hyperopia and the exact reverse happens for a hyperopic correction remember the higher the attempted correction higher is going to be the over or under correction in these eyes so the solution is use a technology that measures both the curvature like a sheen plug imaging or a swept source oct the second error is the radius error the instrument extrapolates the central corneal curvature from the paracentral measurements as you can see here like in a virgin eye the ratio is maintained from center to the periphery but in an eye that has gondorogon and ablation the center is going to be flatter in case of a myopic ablation and the center and the paracentral area is going to be flatter in case of a hyperopic correction so the central to the paracentral area correlation will be absolutely wrong when you are going to take it in this way so in a post myopic ablation as you can see in this image the instrument measures from the paracentral cornea and it extrapolates to the central cornea so it calculates a steeper cornea for the central k so the k is actually overestimated this is very very important if the patient presents with a smaller optical zone and a decent ablation the solution is to use the central values from the tomography rather than the sim k values the third one is the formula error the source of error is because most of the common day to day formulas that is srkt holedo uh, holedo to offer q alls and all these formula uses the keratometry value to predict the effective lens position once your keratometry at the first sitting is wrong the effective lens calculation and lens position calculation will also become erroneous so the consequence is post refractive surgery eyes there will be a reduced corneal power that is calculated leading to an underestimation of elp and the iol power that is calculated so the solution is to use a formula that doesn't use the keratometry for its effective lens position calculation like the hegesel which is incorporated in the iol master so what if you don't have an iol master you can use the double k methods there are a lot of double k methods along with srkt depending on the pre operative data that is available in the hand either the refraction or the keratometry but the problem is most of the time when the patient walks in they will either have the data missing or the data will be unreliable so in such a scenario the old 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 gold method will be to use the shamas no history method which is there in most of the biometers and the melonis method uh, but the current gold standard method is to use a barrett true k formula or the hegesel formula and the way to look forward is by using a gaussian optics formula or the corneal ray tracing formula so if you want to have a one stop if you can't go ahead with multiple calculation the one stop solution would be to use an aps rs calculator which is available which has got the barrett true k formula this is a small case i'll just end up with this case so this patient came in for a routine cataract surgery a 40 year old female so you can see here this is a lens star image the axial lens calculator is 30 and the keratometry is showing 30 the cornea was perfectly fine she denied any history of a refractive surgery 
uh, but to the surprise for a 30 diameter 30 millimeters of axial length the calculation was just 17.5 so went ahead and did the topography as you can see here this is a perfect uh, post myopic ablation to a small zone with a decent ablation we calculated the EKR readings, which was repeatable from the 3 to 4.5 mm. So we inputted the lens star calculation, post refractive calculation, and the APS calculation gave an exactly same value for the Barrett, Ruke, and Shamas. So being the most uh, preferred in the literature, we went ahead with the Barrett, Ruke formula for both days, and the patient had got a very good outcome postoperatively. So the key here is that understanding the signs of IOL power calculation and updating and adopting the newer technologies would be the way forward to tackling all these special situations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jayanthan, for your lovely talk. So uh, when you have cases with long axial length or uh, short eyes, uh, the advantage of using the current generation biometer is, is you actually get to see the four wheel fit. So we can be sure that uh, uh, we don't go through the cephalomatous area and get uh, bad values. So uh, that is something that is very, very significant. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jayantan. So uh, we'll move on to uh, panel discussion. So there was a question by uh, Ramesh Durerajan, uh, sir. So uh, when you see a patient with uh, uh, tearful disturbance, which is the preferred practice pattern? Is a virgin eye better or applying CMC is better? Which is better? Uh, Jainton, what do you uh, do, Jainton, when you have uh, a tear film disturbances? So when you have a tear film disturbance, um, normally you will make out when you are doing a keratometry. So the moment you make out there is a tear film disturbance, it's always better to send the patient on medication, call them back on a different setting and then do the error. Because uh, when it comes to uh, uh, lens star measurement on IL muscle, you're going to take at least five measurements now. So even if the first measurement is good, your consecutive measurement is going to be erroneous. And finally, the standard deviation will be absolutely wrong. So I prefer to do it on a different setting. And when it comes to the lubrication, at least 0.5 CMC is fine. But when you put a one person CMC, that is going to add to your tear of limb and that's going to give an abnormal keratometry values for the patient. So it's always better to treat the ocular surface, call the patient again, and then you can go for the reading. Thank you, Jayantan. So uh, the next question will be for Pratibha. Uh, Pratibha, when you do ultrasound biometry, which do you think is your preferred pattern? You want the patient lying down or sitting or how do you want to do it? Okay. And why? So, um... Coming on to ultrasound telemetry, the preferred technique of choice would be immersion as we have all seen that contact method is uh, more prone for compression and to give false axial length and uh, um, uh, axial length readings. So, uh, and in immersion, I prefer to do the, the patient in supine position. One, because it makes the patient very comfortable. Second, there is uh, less compression from our side also. And uh, the, when, than when we do it in a uh, sitting posture. And third, very important, as I already put in my slides, that uh, uh, sound waves pass through the ocular structures and uh, when, when in supine position and given the patient a target to look straight, the uh, sound waves pass exactly in the uh, visual axis. However, when the patient is in a sitting posture, the, uh, uh, when, the, when the patient has an uh, uh, abnormal posture or slight tilt, the sound waves can be oblique, which can cause poor uh, reflection back into the probe and can cause uh, um, uh, bad spikes like uh, not a good and uh, will not give a good quality uh, amplitude spikes so uh, supine position is better thank you very much uh, Pratibha. Uh, Ramesh sir what is your take on using uh, manual K data and uh, ultrasound uh, biometry data with the Barrett's calculator uh, that is part one Part two of the question is, uh, uh, what is your opinion on uh, this optical ACD which we have to enter? Uh, how can we get the data in case you don't have uh, an optical biometer? Can so, the ASOCT be used? So, uh, yes, you can if you want. The, uh, as far as the biometric calculations are, con are concerned, the ACD is a distance from the tear film to the front of the lens. So you can't take the back of the cornea and the front of the lens. You must take the corneal thickness also. 
So if you're using data from some other source, you have to make sure you're adding the corneal thickness to the anterior chamber tip. So uh, using them in a, in a Barrett's can be done. We have to accept that we'll get suboptimal results. We'll get approximate results. And uh, what we can do is we can add uh, 0.2 millimeters to the axial length and we can use the same data. When we are using the same data, please make sure that the keratometric index is the same, both in your measuring device and, and you're choosing either 1.3375 uh, or 1.334, uh, and that the choice should be correct. Uh, thank you, sir. Sir, and uh, another question is, uh, what is your take on uh, IOL power calculation in post uh, RKI, sir? We'd like to know from RD, sir, and Jainthan, sir. So post RK, no, this is the, the radial keratotomy is called the gift that keeps on giving. What does it give us? It gives us long-term hypermetropia. So whenever you do RK, especially four or six or more number of incisions, the peripheral cornea keeps bulging throughout the lifetime of the patient. So even if you leave them at Plano, two, three years later, they're going to be left with a plus one, four years later with a plus 1.5. So always aim for more myopia because you're going to have long-term hyperopic drift. The second thing is you choose a biometer, a keratometer, which will give you the central corneal thickness in as small a zone as possible. So larger zone will, will measure the mid periphery. You must choose a, as an instrument which measures the, which has the smallest measurement ring. The third thing is that these two formulas, both the, both the cane formula currently and the, and the Barrett's has a keratocone as option. So you can straight away, uh, you can straight away use that particular option. Earlier, what did we have to do? We had to use a standard calculator and then uh, and then adjust more than about 50, you will, you, will, you will add a plus two. You will tend to get uh, hypermetropic crystals. So you will, you, will, you will add a plus two to the lens or a plus three to the lens, depending on the case. That's what we used to do earlier. But currently, you have the option of straight away using the keratoconus uh, formula, both in Barrett's as well as in Keynes. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for bringing in the question, I think, because uh, off late nowadays, uh, it's relatively rare to see post RKIs. That's the reason why I didn't include it uh, in my presentation. Uh, I perfectly accept with RD, sir, uh, regarding the calculation. I would like to add only one point. Clinically, uh, to decide on the prognosis, we need to see on three things. One is the zone, the central zone, the number of incisions, and um, of course, the extent of the incision. So in case if the zone is less than 3 mm, if the incisions are more than 8, and if the incisions are extending to the limbus, definitely this patient is not going to have a very good visual acuity postoperatively. There is going to be a uh, change throughout uh, the next six months after the surgery. So um, what Sir said will definitely holds good if the optic zone is going to be 4 mm, incision that is 8 or less than 8, and if it is not extending to the limbus. So in this eyes, definitely aim for a post-op myopia. Uh, and in two to three months time, the refractive stability will be there. Thank you, Jainthan. Uh, uh, Jainthan, sir, Ramesh, sir, Pratiba, uh, I think we had a wonderful uh, session. Is Arul, sir, there? Okay, we've had an amazing session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Abhijay. Thank you, sir. Uh, 